Council session here. And the first council briefing will be from uh, Deborah Bryan. Good afternoon. It's nice to see you not on the screen. Good afternoon. Right Good afternoon, Mayor, members of City Council. I am happy to be back. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, for as long as I will be back, we don't know right now. We'll find out. Um, I'll tell you the. We'll go to our first. Now, Deborah, oh. real quick before you get started, when yes. you were doing your uh, uh, Zoom briefings with us, uh huh. Were we difficult to hear or see, or did we do okay? No, I could see and hear you fine. Right, good, um, good. Of course, the first one was a little rough because yeah, I, uh, I couldn't see or hear you. So um, I know you were. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, yes. Uh, you did good as well. It was a lobbyist. Um, they, they, yes, right? Hence, any lies. They, the new General Assembly building is hopefully we will be in it next year because uh, right now, you know, we're just in a temporary kind of space. So there just is nowhere. If, Literally, you know, you just kind of find a corner wherever you are. So, um, but we may do. Um, so, as you probably all know, on Saturday at about four o'clock, um, the House and uh, Senate both adjourned. Um, however, the work on the budget isn't complete. Um, and they couldn't come to a resolution. So, they uh, passed a, a resolution that they would be able to come back um, for the budget and then also for the remaining bills. Uh, we do not know when the next when the special session will be, but we're hoping it will be soon. Um, I thought it may be announced by now, but as of now, it's still not announced. Um, the The worst case scenario would be uh, it has to be finalized at least 48 hours before taking effect, uh, which is July 1st. But hopefully, it will be much before then. Um, so. Go. Okay, so just as just a quick um, of where we're at, we ended up with 3,143 bills that were introduced, and we still have 156 of them that are in conference committee that have to be um, figured out. Um, I think there's only now probably uh, we're in the 50s because some of them um, kind of either died or were duplicates, or uh, it's very difficult to because they're you know figure out which one is is now. Um, the, the, the leading contender to be passed. So there still is work to do on both ends, on the budget and on some of the, um, some of the bills that are in conference. Oops, not too good at this. Okay, just a quick recap to remember where we're at. Um, the House still has a, re uh, still, the House this year had a Republican majority of 52-48, um, and we had eight new delegates. Um, they all put in uh, a number of bills. The Senate has a Democratic majority of 21-19. Um, there's been no new senators. The next election um, won't be until 2023. Uh, we failed on the on the budget for right now. Items remaining in conference upon adjournment were 156, and then we're going to have a special session. Hopefully, we'll know soon. Um, the governor's deadline is 30 days to sign, veto, or send back um, revisions or amendments to any of the legislation that is right now on his desk, um, which would be Monday, April 11th. And then our reconvened session will be Wednesday, April 27th. OK, uh, there's a lot of issues of controversy that took up a lot of time, which could be why um, they didn't actually uh, finish. Um, but in, in any case, um, several of the things that you've probably heard on the news that were uh, took a long time on the Senate floor and the House floor was, uh, one, the governor's appointments. Um, because there was a split in control in the two uh, chambers, um, there was a lot of back and forth. The Senate Democrats came out against uh, <coughs> Governor Youngkin's selection for the Secretary of Natural Resources, um, Andrew Wheeler. And then in response, the House countered by withholding confirmation on um, former Governor Northam's uh, pick prior to leaving office as far as the parole board. So those two things took a, a, a really long time. What, uh, what happened today is um, uh, after, uh, I, I believe it was Travis Voiles, who was previously the Deputy Secretary of Natural and Historic Resources, he's going to be the acting secretary, and um, Wheeler is going to be the advisor. So um, that's still not exactly um, 
settled at the at this point. Marijuana le legislation, you know, uh, last year's General Assembly session, there were pages and pages of um, all kinds of legislation that w had various enactment dates. One of the things was by November of 2022, which would have been this year, there was an opt-out um, provision. Um, there was a couple things that this body would have had to have decided. Um, all of that is dead now. Um, because there was a, a second enactment clause, and that was another center of the debate. Um, the Senate advanced a measure that would have allowed, there are existing medical dispensaries now, um, but they would have allowed for uh, sale of recreational use marijuana and all, uh, beginning in September. And um, the House had a few um, legislation pieces that were introduced as well, but none were docketed for hearing, so they all just kind of died. Um, before even getting started. So back to um, marijuana, we'll probably see that come back next year. Um, another thing that was a, a large point of contention was the mask mandates. And um, as you know, uh, the um, Governor Youngkin ended up signing um, a bill to um, make masks optional in schools. Um, that was a, a big event that he had um, during the session. Um, parental empowerment, uh, he also, there was, there was a lot of discussion about um, a youngkin backed bill that gave parents the power to exempt their children from school assignments that involved sexually explicit material. Um, luring of a professional sports team, um, these were two high profile measures that in the creation of the, the lab schools. Um, the Washington commanders, uh, there was a lot of discussion about luring them to, to Virginia, and Virginia, uh, the, in the budget, they're uh, giving them a $1 billion um, incentive mm -hmm. and a cut of sales tax revenue if they do move to the state. Um, the D.C. was uh, um, the other area, um, but uh, the mayor of D.C. DC said that um, they will not be countering that offer of Virginia. Um, the lab schools uh, was something that um, Governor Youngkin was also trying to push, where they would partner with colleges and universities with K-12 schools to expand choice in Virginia. Um, but right now, they're still at the 11th hour negotiations for money to temporarily uh, fund this and I have a handful of schools. So that's all still in controversy. And then, of course, one of the main things that you've heard about every week is tax relief. Um, the tax cuts have been the main sticking point particularly Governor Youngkin's uh, signature effort to double the standard deduction on personal income taxes and to eliminate the state's tax on groceries. Um, the Republican House passed a version of the budget that would do both, um, but the Democratic-controlled Senate preferred a study um, on the standard deduction issue for a year because of its a long-term impact on revenue. So um, that's still it. We, we don't know what the final budget will show. Um, <clears throat> and also the Senate voted to eliminate the 1.5 percent portion of the grocery tax, but to leave the 1 percent, and that's kind of where that was left. Oops. Okay. There's a couple of things that I just wanted to mention that um, we had identified in our uh, weekly <coughs> briefings that we were following. One was the repeal of the same-sex marriage prohibition, which, as you recall, passed in the 2020 2021 um, session and needed to pass a second time, and that failed this year. So uh, that will have to start all over again and make it through two years. The eminent domain issues that came up, um, Senate Bills uh, 666 and 694, were a big point of contention. And uh, thank you to um, our city attorney, Mark Stiles, and his uh, staff, especially Elizabeth Chupik and Becky Kubin, who were on the phone with me daily while I was in the meetings trying really hard to get those in a place that worked for all of us. And I think we finally ended up with something good, um, or at least something that will not hurt things such as our Strawberry Festival um, and uh, the Shamrock Marathon and those kinds of things where um, we would have been liable for any type of lost access during any time period. So we have a seven-day provision on, on those bills now. So unless we um, change access for more than seven days, um, it's not uh, compensable. And there was a couple other uh, little things as far as temporary construction easements and knowing uh, how long they were going to last um, that have been put in the bills. So I think we're in a pretty good place with that. Um, comp time for employees, if you recall last year in the General Assembly session, there was a, a, the Virginia Overtime Wage Act that was put in place and it 
uh, had some unintended consequences in that it then made comp time, something that was important to some of our employees, especially in parks and rec and some seasonal things, um, illegal. It was fixed temporarily in the um, special, Senate, uh, special session budget last summer, but that was due to expire. So um, the uh, now the, uh, the Overtime Wage Act in Virginia was changed, and now it tracks the federal, um, which will now allow us to have comp time again. So I think our um, HR department was very relieved about that. And then uh, you also know about Hampton Roads Transit. There was the $20 million um, for the recordation fees that was going to possibly go away, and all of those bills were defeated. So that money will still come back to Hampton Roads Transit for um, all of our um, transportation needs. So now getting to our legislative agenda. Um, I think we we did pretty well uh, for some of them. Uh, we, we ended up with some good end results, not exactly what we'd expected. The uh, green check are the ones that went through. Of course, our Board of Equalization increased <coughs> members from three to four, went through the House and through the Senate, and was signed by the governor. So that's one. <laughs> the second one are virtual meeting options for advisory boards and commissions. Uh, this was a big point of contention for um, a lot of cities. And the way it finally ended up, um, I think is fine for us because I think we were only really looking to have more virtual options for uh, advisory boards, commissions, more than say the school board or the city council. And uh, many of the other jurisdictions felt that it didn't go far enough. But we did end up it, it, uh, with some extra provisions so that advisory boards and commissions can meet 25% of the time or um, to meet for two meetings a year or 25% of the time, whichever is more virtually if they need to. And then there's also some carve outs for people who either live more than an hour away from wherever the, um, the venue is for the meeting or have a, um, in some sort of infirmity or a family member that they take care of um, that they can't leave the house, that they will be able to have some, um, some time that they can also do virtual meetings. Um, what was the next? Oh, uh, the increase in the civil case filing fee to fund the law libraries, um, that one was defeated. We wanted to go from $4 to $7 as a maximum. Um, we made a good argument that didn't have to be $7, um, but there was no appetite to, um, especially in, in the climate that we had with lowering taxes and things, to even allow anyone to have higher fees. So there was really nothing we could, we could do about that one. Um, we could certainly... Uh, try, they, they said, uh, you know, perhaps there'd be another way to get money to our law library. Um, so that's one that within this year we'll have the libraries look at. Um, the ability to access uh, STR information for our short-term rentals. What we had asked for um, was something that uh, Dana Harmeyer had written to make it not illegal for our, um, uh, our uh, Commissioner of the Revenue and uh, to Tax Assessor Tax Office to be able to share that information with us. Um, we didn't exactly get that, but what we did get is a provision in another code section that says that instead of the accommodations intermediaries and the, sending the, um, their tax money to the state, they are going to send it directly to the city. And within that code section, it says when they do that, they have to give the city, not the, um, the, not the uh, Commissioner of the Revenue, the city has to get a list of the name and the address of where the short-term rental is. So in the end, it will give us the same information we were looking for, just in a different way. Um, the civil penalties for repeated violations I have for blocking the sidewalk, that was our rack um, question. They, the main sticking point on this one is that we were taking something that we normally would, uh, say, prosecute under a um, criminal penalty and we're making it civil. And there was absolutely uh, no in the, um, uh, with the Republican majority, they didn't want to take anything that had to do with reform of any criminal measures. Um, even with the explanation that this wasn't actually a criminal activity, it was just a criminal statute and it was a way to get to the end, they were not interested in taking anything and making something civil. Um, we had a lot of people who also, from other jurisdictions, who uh, discussed this as well and said that this was something they were interested in. The recommendation was to come back and see if there was another way for us to achieve this. And I actually 
actually have a, a meeting with the RIC uh, next month, I believe it is coming up, um, where we can possibly discuss another way that they can get the same result. Um, the FOIA exclusion for identity of nuisance complaints. I have a yellow on that because it didn't actually pass or fail. It was gently laid on the table with a letter sent to the FOIA Council to study it. And that was the bill that we asked for um, for building um, code violations that uh, we didn't have to give. There was an exemption in FOIA where we didn't have to give the name and contact information of the person. And so for this one, we wanted the ability, if someone complained about weeds or something like that, we also wanted to use the same FOIA exemption. Um, uh, Delegate Williams Graves did a fantastic job trying to convince them that this was something that you know would would assist, uh, but they in the end said that they were willing to send it to the FOIL Council for more study. So we'll pick that one back up next year and see if there's a way that we can we can get that. Um, the replacement and preservation of trees during development. Um, there were several bills on this. Several of them failed. Um, but in the end, we did get <laughs> localities, oh, bless you, uh, localities will be giving, bless you, a, a little bit more um, ability to do that. It's a very complicated um, statute that we'll, we'll have to look at and figure out exactly how we do that. But in the end, we, we were able to get a little bit um, out of that. The ability to tap state broadband funding for the regional <coughs> ring. Um, you know, Senator uh, uh, Delegate uh, Glenn Davis put in um, a House bill for that, which uh, the committee did not want to put that in a bill. They didn't want it in the um, in the code sections because that would have been a, a but there really is nothing in there now, so they wanted to keep it in the budget. So that one was also laid on the table and put in the budget instead. In the budget, which isn't passed yet, so this is in the hopeful budget, um, there will be a provision that says that the next round, uh, the, the money that's going to come through from the state that's all reallocated and the money that will come through federally um, will be uh, allowed for authorities for at least 10 percent of the amount that they have. So what we'll have to do then is encourage the authorities and the authority that we belong to, the Regional uh, Broadband Authority, to um, apply for it. One, uh, there's only going to be a set of special amount set aside for authorities, and two, um, we're getting the, uh, the language changed from um, unserved, meaning you have to have no internet at all, to underserved, and hoping the definition of underserved will be uh, broad enough to include, for instance, in Virginia Beach, you could have broadband service to your home, but it may not be adequate for you to work from home plus have five of your children access from home, and that would be considered underserved. And then the last uh, thing that, that will be allowed is middle mile as opposed to just end mile. So I believe hopefully if the budget works out the way we want it to, in the end we will again get what we wanted to. Um, the transportation revenue sharing program, um, it wasn't exactly the amount. You know, we had had this discussion when um, Alex was here about m making it whole again and then uh, adding on. Uh, this one, again, a little bit complicated, but basically it, it's a, a step for this year, next year, and it will end up helping our um, public works to get where it needs to be. So overall... <clears throat> Here's kind of where we came out with our 11 things. Uh, we've got a lot of greens on there, two reds, and this, the yellow one is the one that's going to be going to the FOIA Council, and the white is because we do not know that was if that's going to be in the budget or not. So that remains to be seen. Um, budget, I wish I had more information for you, but I can tell you that um, the House has $5.5 in tax cuts and rebates in its side, um, doubling the standard deduction. Um, reducing the state rev, which if they do end up doubling the standard deduction, it will reduce state revenues by $2 billion over two years. And the House also uh, has in there's fully full repeal of the 2.5% grocery and hygiene products. And the Senate, instead of doing any of those things, would like to punt it all and request a comprehensive study of tax policy for next year. Um, I don't know, of course, we don't know where that's going to end up. I suspect it'll end up somewhere um, in the middle. But the House is really wants to just go with as many uh, tax rebates and relief as possible. And the Senate is afraid that if they do them all at once, um, it will cut services that residents need. So that's kind of where they are, where they are with that. I think hopefully, as I said, we'll, we'll reach a middle ground. And that's it. 
Any questions, Rocky? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And and I, and I tell you, I, I, I want to appreciate your time in Richmond because I know how long it is, and those days become very long, and, and the weeks and the months are long, and I appreciate your work up there. But I want to draw back to you said that the problem with the parole board. So we currently don't have a parole board here in Virginia. So my question is, and you may or may not know the answer, was there any conversation about how we get folks paroled that are worthy of parole and should be out of prison right now? How, how are we doing that minus the parole board? Was there any, <coughs> was there any testimony on that? Yes. Uh, so basically with the three members, there is uh, two members that were rolling off. There was one member that was still going to be there. One of the comments that was made was, uh, will you be happy if we have no parole board because then no one gets paroled? And uh, so that kind of was, that was an option. Um, but the bottom line is then, if there is no parole board uh, because of this process, then the governor gets to appoint one. Okay. Um, and, and that's kind of where they left it. Good. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody else? Guy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Debbie, I, I too want to thank you. I've been in your shoes. I've done, done that, um, your job for another public or uh, non uh, private company but a nonprofit and uh, mm -hmm. it can be exciting every 10 minutes every five or six days but <laughs> the rest of the time it's a lot of hard work and we appreciate it um, you're meeting with Rick to talk about what we need to do to kind of try to uh, revitalize the exemption for uh, public display of goods the misdemeanor problem, the criminal versus civil. Um, I want to ask you about another, is the marijuana. I'm, I'm very concerned that we're, the, the folks in the resort area are not getting all the information they really need to plan for the public, public use of marijuana and sales of marijuana. And um, it's already an issue as, as any any city in Virginia will tell you maybe we need to talk about this offline but I'm very interested in knowing your recommendation for whether it's you or someone you recommend I think the resort the folks in the resort area need a re very reliable source of information on the proposed statutory and regulatory scheme including the, the nitty-gritty of that and actually uh, the folks that are going to be charged with enforcing it, what they think about it and how it's going to work. There, uh, there are a lot of issues there that I think could affect our tourism industry, and I want to make sure it, it at least hopefully doesn't have a negative impact on us and may even have a positive impact. So mm -hmm. I'd like to talk with you maybe offline about that, about making sure we're getting the very best and up-to-date advice on that for our I, industry. I agree. I would add, you know, there are, I believe, three committees at the state level now that are handling uh, various areas of that. I would love you know, get that information for them. Uh, but also from uh, all of that, the best controls we will have will be through our planning planning and zoning. So perhaps that's something also we should get Mr. Tahan involved right. in to have a designee who Def would be definitely part of the issue. Right? <clears throat> who who would part. be doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks okay. again. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so they're going to reconvene session on April 27th. And there's some issues, uh, obviously, with the uh, differences between the House and Senate on the budget that will affect us. So mm -hmm. that's going to be interesting how we do our budget process with an eye on <clears throat> the so resolution. I, excuse me, I'm sorry. If I could clarify, the April 24th date is the reconvene session at, after this session when we get the budget. So when the, bu the budget, we could be called back next week. Okay. And so at that point, we will have the budget. That's when it will go to then the governor and he will have until uh, like April 11th, do his uh, whatever it is he would like to do with it, send it back to us, and then the 27th will just be a one-day session where they will just have to agree to adopt it. 
So there will be time within there where we can look at it before the governor makes any of his recommendations. Okay. Um, because there's some pretty stark differences, obviously, between the House and the Senate. <clears throat> and then secondly, do you know if <clears throat> once it is determined what the uh, budget is going to be, and particularly when it comes to tax cuts and rebates, are they going to do some kind of analysis on what impact that has on the average citizen in terms of tax relief? Are, are they going to provide any kind of information on that? Um, yes, and I believe they've already started that at different levels. For instance, there was uh, some analysis of how much the grocery tax uh, will impact, and it, it, it was something like 700 and change dollars per year per average citizen. Okay. Um, they're doing the same thing with the gas tax, whether it be that they're going to give a reprieve. So they will do breakdowns. Um, and I said the one that, I, that I've gotten so far is the grocery tax one. Okay. Um, now, whether or not that is the entire 2.5% or whether that's just the 1.5% without the, the other, um, I know uh, the economist at um, BML, Baco, and all, they are all doing that as well. So as soon as I get any of that information, um, I will let you know. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Anybody else, John? Well, first of all, thank you so much. This, this is the best service we have ever received from the General Assembly in all the years that I've served. So thank you for setting a new standard of, in, of providing us information real time. That is certainly a new level of information. I do appreciate it. Yeah. And I also want to make sure that we uh, acknowledge that Barry Knight did a super job on the Appropriations Committee, you know, for for us on a number of things, but also in back in the governor's proposal and mm -hmm. Senator DeSteff and Senator Keegan did the best they could do on the Senate side. So I look, I look forward to uh, great success, but I appreciate you keeping us real time informed. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure and my honor. And I can tell you that um, uh, Chairman Knight worked tirelessly. I was in his office many times. He was there seven in the morning, seven at night. and. No matter what time I would come, he would always sit down with me, no matter what was going on, and talk. And so he gave us as much time and energy as was needed. Um, and he even met with um, myself and several others for um, some of the federal money that was going to be flowing through the state, not for this particular, but for what's coming ahead. So he, he's been a very, very good advocate for us. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Bryan, I just want to thank you on behalf of a grateful council for your stellar work up there. It's not easy. Um, I tell you what, it's like trying to pick up mercury when you drop a thermometer, okay? <laughs> uh, but, you know, thank you very much and appreciate it. Well, thank John. you very much for allowing me to do it. He's a rock star. I'm thinking that back mercury. I remember playing with it in my hand. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Rouse, I understand you asked for a withdrawal for, from Dr. Ha Harris? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, his, uh, he got his flight got canceled, um, so he was unable to make it here in time for city council. So he, he asked for us to uh, get back on the schedule sometime. Yeah, let's get him back on the schedule. Uh, you know, I've worked with him a number of years at Regent. He speaks and, very uh, highly of him. He's a great guy. Yeah. You know, very worth hearing. Okay, if we can go on now to the city manager fiscal relief initiative, uh, where I asked Kevin and uh, Vice Mayor Wilson and I thought it might be advantageous at this point to bring forward to the public right before we start getting into the budget about what we have done and what we are continuing to do. And um, in terms of a little preview of the state of the city tomorrow, we're going to be able to articulate a number of programs and things that we've been doing, not only to help businesses, but individuals and everything. So appreciate you coming forward. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, as the mayor just said at the request of Vice Mayor and Mayor, um, the information I'm going to present today was included to city council in a Friday packet item um, a few weeks ago as informational um, related to a question that we had received. And so um, in helping me gather this information and put together this presentation, I would like to uh, thank Abiola Kazim. Um, she's an intern. Um, go ahead, stand up, Abiola. Yep. 
She's interning with us from Regent University in her last semester of the MPA program. And um, I just really want to thank her. So interestingly, she also uh, used to be a, a geologist for um, Shell Petroleum. So uh, we have a uh, renaissance woman working in the uh, budget office this time of year. So um, she's a huge help. Did you say Regent MPA? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dear to my heart, I was there 12 years. Kevin, I think it's also important to acknowledge that the intern has had to take on a, a more hands-on role as part of the budget as Kevin is 50% without 50% vacancy in his office as well. So she's been taking a lot of work on in terms of helping us okay. with the budget. Definitely a intern that is learning by trial by fire. <laughs> that is for sure. So anyways, I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that and thank her. Um, in putting this together also, um, you know, it was looking back over the series of action items City Council had taken over the last two years. Uh, it was two years ago, I believe this week, that I was presenting or working on a presentation um, of the FY21 proposed budget knowing full well it was dead on arrival. Um, the pandemic had taken effect and um, in looking back over this, it was uh, basically looking at two years worth of a bad dream that I think we all wish we could uh, forget, but it certainly um, definitely highlights uh, the amount of good work that the city did over the last two years to put forth a lot of um, relief initiatives um, for the community. So um, without further ado, uh, so the organization of this um, is going to be in the format of just that. So I'm going to lay out the information based on the fiscal year in which the relief or the initiative put forward by city council was initiated. Uh, so it really spanned three fiscal years. The pandemic began um, technically in FY20 and city council immediately took action at that point in time also within the FY21 budget and again within the current budget FY22. Uh, in total, cumulative relief efforts to date um, is $105 million. Um, there's an item in front of City Council today and should City Council provide to, decide to provide additional relief through um, applying the fair market value to personal property um, bills, then that could be potentially another $38 million to um, add to that re relief effort to date. Um, also, uh, acknowledging um, that this was available through multiple funding sources, um, a combination of uh, which were local funds, CARES Act funds, and um, ARPA funds that came at a later point in time. Uh, so, like I said, this really began um, in the fiscal year FY20, um, and City Council, whenever the economy, be economy began to um, be shut down, City Council uh, began redirecting local funds to try to provide relief towards businesses um, and those in need. So, you can see here that through these two initiatives in Council direction, um, $2.5 million of local funds were redirected to apply or provide uh, small business grant relief as well as uh, EDIP grant relief or assistance. Uh, with the adoption of the FY21 operating budget and just before that, uh, City Council continued that effort um, through the use of local funds with providing a meals tax holiday, which is estimated to have a uh, impact of about $12 million of relief. Um, in addition to that, City Council also made a decision to delay penalties and interest and in, um, personal property, uh, restaurant meals tax, hotel tax, and some all the taxes that are um, to be provided and collected and um, provided to the city by businesses. Um, with the adoption of the operating budget, City Council was also proactive in looking to provide personal, proper, personal property and real estate tax relief efforts. Um, there was two programs, or there was a program put in place in which Human Services um, was attempting to administer the funds, um, identify eligible individuals who were um, experiencing economic hardship, and provide um, tax relief to those um, citizens that were determined to be eligible. Another program City Council put in place with the adoption of the operating budget was to provide utility tax relief. Uh, this was a combination of an effort between public utilities and human services, of which individuals that were identified as being in need uh, could relieve, be provided assistance and relief in the utility bill. Um, and then with the uh, summer months and the, uh, the approval of the CARES Act of the federal government, the city of Virginia Beach um, began receiving CARES Act allocations. 
Um, so these were federal funds that were provided. And out of the gate, initially, when city council appropriated it, there were a couple of programs and initiatives put into place. Uh, one was to provide $1.8 million in nonprofit um, relief and assistance. Um, I recall that one very closely as my staff was um, working to uh, review uh, grant applications and administer those to eligible um, applicants. Uh, something very challenging at that point in time was that the U.S. Treasury was writing the rules as they were telling us um, to spend the funds by a six-month period, within a six-month period. Um, so it was very um, difficult to do that and also um, restrictive at the same time. Um, we did that in combination with um, assistance from cultural affairs. Another administered city administered program through the Use of CARES Act was a business relief um, small business relief initiative, and that was administered by the Department of Economic Development. And again, that was trying to um, interpret the rules being laid out by the U.S. Treasury and apply those. Um, in total, <laughs> those efforts were 24, or excuse me, 21.4 million. Uh, within the same year, um, the city received an additional allocation of CARES Act funding. Um, and this time, there was a little bit more clear guidance from the U.S. Treasury in which the city was able to um, reimburse itself for eligible expenditures. In this instance, it was payroll, um, payroll costs. And city council gave the clear direction that that was not to just hold the city harmless, but to turn around and provide as much as relief possible um, to the public. So that's why you'll see the source of these funds as being local funding and CARES Act. Um, because the amount of funds that went out and was provided uh, were, were basically general fund dollars that were free and clear of any strings um, associated with the uh, federal spending. Uh, so uh, cumulatively, uh, you'll see that there were a lot of various actions that went towards the VB Relief Initiative. This was a partnership with United Way, Food Bank, LISC, and the Workforce Council um, in which they partnered together and they um, accomplished about $28.8 million worth of relief efforts throughout the community. Um, these ranged from um, providing additional food services to providing fiscal utility relief to households, businesses, small business grants, um, and one including one allocation was specifically carved out to uh, focus on uh, restaurant business relief. Um, two other standalone action items by council during um, last fiscal year was um, a, an, an attempt to uh, provide special event fee reduction or a relief to um, special events that were looking to come to the city during um, a really uncertain time um, and host events here. The city council waived those fees for that year and also um, in the same fiscal year, City Council provided additional business relief by um, suspending the ABC license tax for the calendar year, FY21. So in FY22, City Council's initiatives really continued with the adoption of the FY22 budget. So out of the gate, with so much uncertainty in the economy, City Council um, decided to continue to provide relief efforts and reduce the real estate tax rate by 2.75 cents. This resulted in about $17 million of reduced tax burden to the businesses and residents of Virginia Beach. Um, also, about that same point in time, there was additional allocation from the federal government through the ARPA funds. Um, city Council received, or City Council recalls, City received about $134 million in um, ARPA funding of which City Council was very clear in their appropriation of that, that they wanted a good portion of that to go back towards the community and the businesses and residents in need. So again, um, turning to the playbook that we utilize with the CARES Act, uh, we look to partner with our uh, regional uh, nonprofit organizations that know best. And so um, through the um, partnership with United Way, um, as well as LISC and the Food Bank. Um, there's been allocations of the ARPA funds that have been provided to those organizations to help um, provide additional fiscal relief, more specifically the largest allocation to United Way for VB, their VB Thrive initiative. So in total, through the use of ARPA funds, an additional $30 million was provided um, for that purpose. And then to round it out, the last um, approval to date was for additional utility relief. And this is through a direct allocation of ARPA funds to the Pu Department of Public Utilities, in which they have $4 million to um, forgive, uh, basically, um, 
accounts that have a, uh, a balance and individuals don't have the ability to catch up and get ahead on that. They have the ability to work with those individuals to provide that level of relief. So in total of the $105 million cumulative relief that's been provided to date over those three fiscal years, this is just a visual pie chart that shows what the allocation of those resources were. Um, so you can see here that although the injection of federal funds to the use of CARES and um, ARPA funds were you know, close to 30, 33%, um, the city of Virginia Beach through the allocation of local funds uh, provided $38 million worth of relief. And so that's really above and beyond. And I can really say uh, that to the best of my knowledge, I'm not familiar with another locality that has um, provided this level of relief um, through the allocation of these funds or through local funding um, like the city of Virginia Beach has. So um, with that, um, really, it's just the, it's an informational presentation. I'll be glad to take any, Thank you, any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chatelier. Um, I really appreciate your presentation, and, and I want to thank the mayor and vice mayor for um, ask for requesting this briefing to um, kind of recap some of the activities that have occurred over the last two years. I don't really have a question other than that I have a comment um, because I, I really hope that this presentation and the delivery of relief through um, federal funds as well as through the use of local funds, as you pointed out, and even I didn't realize how substantial that was. Um, I really hope this is a source of pride for the people who live in Virginia Beach um, as well as for our city generally. It is for me um, because particularly as it relates to the partnerships with nonprofits who are delivering relief. This was an innovative technique that Virginia Beach led the country on. And as a result, we were able to optimize efficiencies that exist within our nonprofit communities through organizations that are already proficient in providing the types of relief we were endeavoring to deliver. Um, and so by forging those partnerships, we eliminated the red tape we eliminated the barriers. The nonprofits were incredible partners by making, I heard the grant applications were the easiest that many of our partners had ever interfaced with. And, um, you know, that's that's really is something to be proud of because we used these resources very wisely, very efficiently, and we delivered uh, timely relief at a time when it was really needed. Could we have done better in certain areas? Sure. I'm sure we could do a whole you know, debrief on that and think about areas where we, if we could do it over, we would have improved. But this is a moment, I think, to not necessarily celebrate, but at least to recognize the achievements that were made during the last two years, because I think it's something our city should be very proud of. And I'll, and I'll provide in, in conclusion just a comparison. I'm not going to name any names, but there are other cities, you know, our sister cities in the region who are still determining what to do with this funds. And, you know, I think we all know that when people are in need of relief as a result of a situation like this, they need immediate relief. So the notion that, you know, our partners in the region and around the country are just beginning to, um, I want to say they're just beginning, but they're, they still haven't appropriated these funds, they still haven't delivered them to the citizens, really speaks highly to the competency of your team. And I want to thank Mr. Duhaney for that and as well for, um, for this council and for our community who came together to deliver this very effectively and efficiently in a timely manner. And I um, just want to thank you all, and I'm really proud to have been part of this effort. Hey, anybody else, John? I want to ditto remarks of Mr. Belushi relative to how well we did. And, uh, but also to point out is that, you know, our society has the bottom 20%, the top 20% and the middle. And these programs help a lot of people in the bottom because of all the qualifications. But the people in the middle, not poor enough to get help, but not wealthy enough not to need help, we didn't, they didn't get much relief out of much of that. Though that shouldn't put aside what we did because those people would have just went under. And I'm sure all of us would rather make, keep someone from drowning as long as we weren't drowning ourselves. But I think it also shows the leadership of this body that when we put our mind to it, we can deliver on revenue neutral real estate rates. And that to me just sets a foundation of what people should expect. 
going forward as to what we do. And, and I think that we are in, even under more serious times today than we were with the pandemic in terms of people's purchasing power of their income. For those who were working, they managed that fairly well. I won't say great, but they could manage that. But no one can be managing the reduced purchasing power of double-digit inflation on food and energy and utilities. That's a corrosive purchasing power. So I hope that as we approach this budget cycle, we will be as equally ambitious uh, and exceeding our past successes in terms of uh, delivering broader-based uh, tax relief. But we should take great pride. And I think I've said this many times. Someone should have asked us to come and testify before Congress and say, how did you do this? And uh, we didn't keep the money to balance our books. We gave it to the people who needed it the most. And in today's environment, going into our budget, now everybody needs some kind of relief to compensate for double-digit gas prices, more so double-digit foods, and the tremendous increase in the assessments of their property. So I look forward to working with this body to repeat that great success. Thank you. Hey, anyone else? Yeah, let me just say, uh, Kevin, and I think you hit on something. You know, I'm hard-pressed to find a city that came out of COVID better than we did for a lot of reasons. And, um, you know, germane to what I'm going to be saying tomorrow at noon, not one person does this type of stuff. It takes a team. It takes a council. It takes a uh, management staff and team. It takes... You know, people still working, but once again, uh, you know, people working in the communities that are taking care of the elderly, that take care of the affirmed, uh, and, you know, and just doing all the right things for the right reasons. And I think, you know, what, what Mr. Moss said was right, but, what, you know, it's what we're going to do going forward. Uh, and, you know, with the VB Hive and all the initiatives that we're going to have are trying to bring businesses here. And, you know, Mr. Bellucci, you know, as a, when you talk about the term point of pride, uh, last year I was able to do 50, um, from what I'm told, 50 ribbon cuttings and grand openings of places during the height of the COVID. Our hotels had a banner year. We were able to be respite for a lot of families that lived and were uh, in you know, uh, driving distance and come here and do things. Uh, you know, we were able to, even the year before, get our beaches open. And that took a lot of hard work, and, you know, especially on the staff part, coming up with a plan, uh, you know, that then the uh, governor could live with. But once again, this was a total team concept. And, you know, I think one of the confounding things is that, uh, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, they didn't have to go to work over the last year or two, and that labor continues to be, you know, a problem that we're going to have to address. But overall, I tell you what, it's, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm personally uh, grateful for a council that came together and put together unanimous budgets and got the, the right things to people at the right time. Uh, it was a combination of nonprofit, small businesses, individuals, utility, uh, uh, bill relief, and things like that. I, like I said, I'm not aware of too many cities that went to that magnitude like that. And I think that really accounts as the roadmap of how we came through this in a city. But the good news is we are poised right now to go forward with business opportunities and you know, I think everyone at this die has always had, uh, you know, the saying, we want to provide, we want our kids staying in Virginia Beach when they graduate from, uh, you know, school. And we're going to bring in those really good paying jobs and diversify our economy and bolster it. But once again, I think it was an incredible team effort by the council, management, our city employees, and the people in our committee and the nonprofits that know their communities better than we ever can. People that are in the community know their communities, and they were able to get things done. But once again, 
Thanks again. Thank you all. Okay, Mr. Dehaney. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, Letitia Shelton, the city's finance director, will give you an update on our 21-22 finances. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, City Council. I'm Letitia Shelton, the finance director, here to present the city's interim finance report through February. Okay. <clears throat> All right. General funds revenue through February are 652, $652 million and are 52% of the budget and exceeds the prior year by $65 million or 11%. <clears throat> Real estate, personal property, Sales, mill, and hotel taxes all contribute to this increase during this period. General fund expenditures of $898 million, or 64% of the FY22 budget, exceeds the prior year by $57 million. This slide chart before you depicts a two-year average for general fund actual revenues and expenses. As you can see, the actual revenues, the blue line, are 52% through February and are tracking 4% higher than the two-year average of 48%. The actual expenditures of 64%, the green line, are tracking 5% below the two-year average of 69%. Real estate taxes revenue is $308 million, which is 52% of the current year's budget and reflects an increase over prior year by $3 million. Property, personal property tax revenue is $28.3 million, which is 24% of the current year's budget and is over the prior year by $7.5 million. General sales taxes are $53.2 million, which is 73% of the current year's budget and exceeds the prior year by $6.4 million. Just to, as a reminder, sales tax is on a two-month lag, so collections through February represents June through December sales. Restaurant, restaurant meal tax revenue is $36.5 million, which is 91.6% of the current year's budget. Meal tax is also a one-month lag, so collections through February represent sales from sales in June through January. Hotel room revenue is $7.8 million, which is 108% of the current year's budget and exceeds the prior year by $2.5 million. Hotel taxes also a one month leg, so collections through February too also represents June through January. This slide depicts is um, representation of the salaries. So total cost through February is 279 million or 62% of the total budget, which is 22.3 million over the yep. prior year. The total payroll cost represents 17 of 26 pay periods. That's pretty much my presentation. Okay. Short and succinct. We're good All financially. Right. Anybody, John? Question. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned when we're looking at personal property tax is when a tax collected is not a tax collected. <laughs> so, and then I learned that personal property tax that's paid late after the year closes out is attributed to the current year as a collection. They don't go back and readjust the book. So of the amount that we've collected to date in real estate, how much of that is taxes collected from a prior year that were paid in this year and penalties on that tax? And how much of that really is on what we build? And I'm, and I'm sure I, last time I checked about 24% of our homes were owner owned and they paid their taxes every six months. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's still true, but that's the last number I recall. Um, so I'm just curious when I see that number up there, how much of that that was billed payable in de on December 5th versus collected for prior years or penalties and interest okay. was actually collected. That can come at a later date, but I'd like to know what we actually collected and what was billed. And I know it's different from that number. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you a Thank bunch. You. Okay. And moving on. All right. 
Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time, Michael Kirschman, Director of Parks and Rec, will provide council an uh, update on the item that we want to bring before council for consideration at a later date. Good afternoon, Mayor Good Dyer, afternoon. Vice Mayor Wilson, How you doing? members of council, Manager Duhaney. Hopefully this will not take too long. Um, this is relatively straightforward, and what we're aiming to do here is align the regulations at Little Island Park with the oceanfront. So without further ado, do I have a clicker? Here's your clicker. Um, uh, it was, it's over there. Somebody stole the clicker. <laughs> Okay, so the, the I, lieutenant governor used her <laughs> shoe. <laughs> okay, so uh, quickly, I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with Little Island Park, and in, in my opinion, a little piece of heaven here in Virginia Beach, and one of my favorite places to go. Uh, so there's a, an aerial shot of it, looking north to south. Uh, we have a, about a 2,000 foot of beach. We have the pier. We have playgrounds. We have uh, large shelters that are extensively rented throughout the season and a very large parking lot that's about to get expanded once again. Um, and of course, just north, just south of that is uh, Back Bay National Wildlife Refuge, and then on into North Carolina. Okay, uh, there's what it looks like. I'm sure you're all familiar with the site. It gets very busy uh, during the peak season. And what we discovered um, is that during uh, peak season, of course, we have surfers, we have um, people that come to swim, but we also have people that come to fish from the beach. The issue has been that historically, we have um, asked people to fish towards the southern end of the property. We do have verbiage on our website that speaks to that. We have signage on site that says to move south um, from the fishing pier, which is right here. We kind of reserve this for swimming. And we ask people to use any of this long stretch down to there to do any type of surf fishing from the beach uh, during the peak season. Of course, the beaches can get crowded. We don't want people throwing rods in when there's thousands of people swimming. Uh, however, it's come to our attention uh, really that there is no formal ordinance to this effect. This has really been a department request and a best practice that we've tried to do over the years. Uh, the vast majority of the public, when and if they want to throw their rod in during the day, we say, can you, can you move to the south? And they do. Uh, the lifeguards will do that. Uh, the lifeguards are operated, of course, by EMS, the park staff by Parks and Recreation. And together, we'll ask people to move. Uh, however, um, again, there is no formal ordinance. Technically, if somebody wanted to throw their rod in in the middle of the swimmers, there is no regulation uh, that we could force them to move. Uh, this came to my attention uh, last year. We did have a complaint where a, an older gentleman showed up uh, with their grandchild, wanted to teach them how to fish from the beach, uh, was asked to move further down, uh, but due to mobility issues, did not want to move down. And so this, again, created a conflict. Uh, we had one uh, I found out after the fact uh, years ago in July 2017. So every few years, uh, we have, seems we have a complaint saying, well, I don't, I don't want to move to the, to the south end. Um, what we would like to do is here is the current uh, oceanfront ordinances, which gives specific times uh, to when people can uh, fish from the beach and not fish. With city council's concurrence, what we'd like to do is extend the ordinance, slightly tweak it from the oceanfront, basically down to Little Island as well, which is on the Atlantic Ocean, same beach, just a couple miles down, down the shore. And working with the city's attorney's office, uh, the new ordinance would read, if approved, unlawful to fish from the sand beaches at 42nd Street to Rudy Inlet and at Little Island Park from the northern property line boarding the sanctuary condominium southward to 1,400 feet, basically towards the south end of the property, um, really the majority of the park, 1,400 feet down to the back bay line. And this would be between certain hours during the weekdays and weekends during the resort season. The resort season was just moved up to, to, um, to there in the, in the specific wording. Um, just so everybody knows as well, we also do have the all-terrain um, beach chairs for people who have mobility issues 
uh, available at all times um, at Little Island, and we're always happy to assist with people if they need to get further down the beach and can't quite get there on their own or need some assistance. So the same all-terrain beach chairs that we have at the oceanfront, we have at Little Island as well. Uh, again, this would just be um, one ordinance change that would move to that language and include Little Island Park. Um, the other alternatives are to continue as is and let people fish um, <laughs> right in the middle of, of the swimmers. Uh, we certainly don't recommend that. We don't think that is very safe uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we don't believe it's recommended to do a whole different set of guidelines for Little Island. We, we think we can just make them consistent with the oceanfront and it would work out just fine. Um, really what we're recommending is um, with city council's uh, concurrence to proceed with uh, the recommended change. If so, um, we would come back in two weeks for public comment. And following the public comment period, uh, two weeks after that, I'll uh, be requesting a vote by council so that we can implement this by peak season. And with that, I'll take any questions. Guy, Michael, Rosemary, John, Lewis. Wow. And a partridge. <laughs> and a wow. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. I just really had a question about the other oceanfront beaches. Just uh, what what are the rules regarding Croatan and Sandbridge? They, as as far as I know, there are really there no are specific no rules. rules there. However, we operate Little Island as a park, right. um, and we have Understand. staff there. The oceanfront has lifeguards, and so it's possible uh, to enforce rules and regulations. Whereas when you look at Chicks Beach and, and Croatan Beach, uh, there, there's no staff there at any time. And they're not as crowded, I would say, or create quite the conflicts that a, a little island park or an oceanfront creates, just my personal opinion. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Mr. Kirschman. Could you go back to the slide? Um, I don't know what number it is with the map, you know, the, the breakdown. Yep. There we go. So I, I'm sure you've thought this out, but I just wonder if you could provide insight into your calculations for the different ratios you used in your formulation here. Because it seems to me, I visit, I visit that park sometimes too, and um, it seems like that's a small space for swimming mm -hmm. relative to the space for fishing. I know fishing takes more space and all that, and surfing. So. Um, I just wonder if that's enough room for people who just want to sunbathe and, and swim. Yeah. Can you provide some thoughts? It's a great question. Really, and, and Frank Ventress is here as well. I think you all know Frank. He and the team at, at Parks and Landscape Services uh, manage this park as well as the other parks. Uh, really, what we find is the vast majority of swimmers always stay contained to this area. It is convenient with the access points to the parking lot. It is convenient to the restrooms. And really, this entire stretch uh, stays wide open uh, in terms of people not wanting to take their kids and, and lounge chairs and stuff kind, kind of that far. But the fishers will walk down there, throw their rod in. and um, So even during peak season, uh, we believe this is certainly adequate for swimming versus fishing. Sorry, and one quick follow-up. Thank you. Is, the, is there any prohibition on swimming in the fishing area, assuming that council would adopt this ordinance? So in other words, the person, like if no one was fishing, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, there is not. Technically, you could. We don't see it too often because if there's five people lined up with rods, nobody wants to go swimming in there because the lines disappear. You swim anytime, even if they were fishing? Technically, you could. There'd be no prohibition. Uh, but there we'll, is a prohibition on fishing in the swimming area. That's correct. Okay. That's um, correct. Mr. Kirsten, um, if I could, yeah. Mr. Mayor, there is, isn't there um, restrictions on swimming so next to the bulkhead over there I thought there were restrictions you couldn't swim within a certain at the ocean front at Rudy at Rudy right. Inlet uh, yes there are those and there's also restrictions uh, uh, you cannot swim so many feet from the fishing pier so there to there yeah you cannot swim um, or surf as well right any projection of the water right where the I guess the thousand feet um, purple line is the, the Rudy Inlet rocks is so inlet is right there. Isn't there's a sign that says you can't swim so close to those rocks, right? No, this is Little Island down in Sandbridge so, that we're okay. looking at, okay. uh, not near the ocean front. Okay. But you are correct. Near the inlet, you can't swim anywhere near the, the rock protrusions out in okay. the ocean. Okay, no. good. Rosemary, then John, then Laura. I'm sorry, I may be reading this wrong. Um, to me, this is saying you can't fish at all between these hours. 
from Back Bay to the sanctuary. You can't fish during those hours in this area. Okay, well, this says the property line bordering Back Bay Wildlife Re Refuge <laughs> and the sanctuary. It shall be it shall be unlawful to fish at Little Island Park from the northern property line boarding the sanctu sanctuary county in southwards to yes so <coughs> southwards to so basically what it's saying is let me go back you can't fish from here that's the sanctuary to here and then here you can okay correct me if I'm wrong Mark. I believe that's what it says. Yes. Okay. That's what it's intended to say. Just want to make sure it's clear. And um, and there'll be a sign there at that mark. We, right? we, we, we have a sign there at the mark. We have a sign at the entrance. We'll, we'll change our website to make that clear. Um, yes. And I think that's a, a good point was made that the fishing area should be designated for fishing only. It's not. We, we, we could. We typically have not done that. Nor is it at the ocean front. So the ocean front outside these hours, outside these areas, Technically, somebody could go jump in the ocean in front of a fisherman, but that would really, well, we haven't seen that happen, and that would be kind of intruding on somebody else's space where they got there first, and they're fishing there, and, and that's kind of their, their spot. But yeah, it's something sure. that could be considered if, if yeah. council so desires. And I'm sure like getting the fish the hack hooks out of you will discourage I guess that. I live on the boardwalk, and we've got the bike path, and all these people they're using the bike path or using the boardwalk and yes it's very there's conflicts there there's definitely and it's frustrating as well thank you oh thank you john well those were two of the questions i had so my only recommendation at this point was with the ordinance because reading words i hope that when it's online or maybe when we adopt it that a you know we have really great google maps top view side view whatever view it would be great that the ordinance certainly would have a pictorial attached to it and online it would definitely be able to give you the 3D look that those kind of applications today allow so that people that want to go look or a lifeguard could say, no, I can pull my phone, yeah. I can show you. I mean, I know that could, today the phones are great, but having the visual of that would be very, very helpful. Good idea. We can certainly do that. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Jones. I'm curious. Has anybody been hooked? <laughs> Not to my knowledge, although I don't think the people that could ask that would be the lifeguards because they'd be the ones probably responding. Um, I don't know of any myself. That's not to say it hasn't happened. That's not a magic Kodak moment we want to see. No. <laughs> okay. Anyone Michael, else? Leave it in. Hey, Michael, you're doing a great job. Great. Thank you. And uh, I'll tell you what, you've got a big responsibility. Right. In a town full of 460,000 people, 500 square miles, and a, a bunch of parks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, at this point, council discussion, initiatives, and comments. Anybody? Yeah, John. The bikes, trailways, and waterways they met yesterday. They'll be coming forward in the near future giving their annual report. But uh, there was a great briefing by... Uh, the Public Works Department on all the transportation grants that are out there, and there was a nice uh, visual in that. Patrick, that one thing might be a great slide to share with all councils. It was a comprehensive list of all the grants that are out there, and it was quite impressive. Hats off to all the people. Uh, this is just a, a general comment uh, that I've mentioned before. You may recall when we had the Greenwich Road Apartments, and we rezoned industrial property to apartments. And I raised the question as to whether or not, since we talk about often here we don't have enough land, don't have the right kind of land, and the kind of land we need for development is often industrial. And I, and I question how that gets dealt with and how we make the trade-offs in our decision-making process and how, the planning, how our planning staff considers that. We have another in the, foregoing, in the upcoming future, another case where industrial property is being proposed to be converted to residential, which has taken us in the opposite direction of our long-term strategy. Um, I've asked a number of questions of the uh, staff, and I've asked, not today, but at a future date, that we get an opinion from our 
outstanding deputy city manager dealing with economic development to make sure that we have a consistent thought process among ourselves as to how we plan to get there if we continue to convert because the marketplace today is favoring residential development on return. You only have to, I don't know how many you get solicitations in the mail, I know do, or you know, on emails to invest in apartments and look at the cash flow and the rate of return is quite high. You know, do we want to, in this case, let the market drive our conversion process? Or do we really want to hold to the longer term strategy of diversification or tax base? But we're going to continue to see this. And so we need to be thinking heavily about that in advance. And, I, and I've asked the staff to provide us some insight. Uh, looking forward to things. I don't know how many people probably don't at 530 in the morning listen to commodity markets. But <coughs> there are two big movements which will be affecting in the summer and fall to our, con our consumers. One is the per ton cost. This is raw delivery. This is not delivered to the farmer price. A year ago it was 265 a ton. Today it's over $800 a ton. One third of all the exportable grain comes from Ukraine. They're not planting grain, <laughs> wheat. So those are issues coming downstream. And if Ms. Henley was here, I'm sure if they're planting wheat, they'd be glad because wheat is up 66% per bushel over a year ago. So these are prices working through the commodity markets into the retail consumer. And there's a three to six month delay. So as we look at the budget process, we have to be thinking ahead to not only the financial stress our households are facing today, but what they're going to be facing in six months. And there really isn't any mitigation that the private market can do about those price increases. So I'm just making people mindful that the inflationary pressures that we see are far from over, and we're working ourselves towards by the artificially suppressed inflation rate of the federal government of 10% for the year. And, that's, and that is tremendously uh, taking out energy, taking out food, and the water realtors had a publication, which you may have seen, Ms. Wilson, that the average rents for a single bedroom apartment in the region year over year, that was January 22 over January 21, was 18% was the average rate increase. So these are all pressures that uh, folks are under, and I think we need to make sure that we're, we're taking those into consideration as we make the many decisions that face us. And I thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Wilson, and then Mr. Wooten. Well, I'm pleased to announce that the uh, Southeast Network Authority, our broadband ring, has signed the contract to actually build, uh, build it and, and start construction. Uh, we initially, uh, Cox Communications had initially won the bid. However, they decided not to go through with it. So Daniela is going to be building it for $24.5 million. So hopefully we can get some of that money also that Debbie talked about um, in the state budget this year, which be 10%, but 10%, $24 million is still a significant amount of money. So, But it's very exciting. It's, it's moving forward. This is going to be super ultra-fast broadband, which is going to also uh, help us with budget, too, because we'll be able to utilize it for our city, and <clears throat> it'll, be, it'll save us a lot of money for all of our communication needs as far as broadband is concerned, uh, but also, you know, bring in industry and jobs. So this is this is an exciting time for us. Thank you. Ms. Wharton. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I want to bring up two uh, items. The first one uh, has been placed at your desk. It's a substitute version uh, for uh, K-6 that will be coming up on our agenda. Uh, like you, I received many calls and emails regarding um, the terms gun violence. And uh, as you know, there is another resolution um, that will be before us tonight for a permanent memorial for DeShayla Harris, who was, her life was tragically lost May 26th uh, during a mass shooting at the oceanfront. And so out of that uh, and the presentation that was given on February 22nd, where she came and spoke and relayed her request to you. Uh, I understand there was some uh, feedback that there should be an acknowledgement of other uh, individuals, innocent victims who lost their life uh, through gun violence. 
hence the resolution that I set forth for a separate memorial for gun violence victims. Well, uh, after presenting both of those resolutions, uh, there were residents in the community and groups who uh, reached out and wanted the removal of gun violence. Uh, now, because of those concerns, I submitted a substitute version which removes gun violence uh, and expands the resolution to include people who have lost their lives uh, prematurely, whether through as innocent vi victims of violence, uh, through COVID-19, uh, a car crash, or any other uh, ways that they've lost their life. And they request, or their families request that they be remembered, that resolution uh, will replace the K-6. Uh, and also, uh, people who have lost their lives through gun violence will be recognized through that resolution as well if council sees fit to approve it. And so just wanna make sure my colleagues uh, have that information. Happy to talk about it uh, a, a bit more if you would like to. But if you notice in the resolution, it also talks about uh, starting um, a website that where names appear for victims. And then perhaps moving forward uh, with planting trees for victims uh, throughout the city in different places, uh, which will be good for the environment. So I uh, tried to come up with some creativity here. Uh, however, in any event, whatever we come up with has to be approved by council. Uh, would all also require your input, and so it's not something that will be done without your input and without your approval. So that's the first item that I have. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, I was uh, hosting, or it, it was a pleasure to host our uh, first pitch competition on Saturday uh, the 12th at the Virginia Beach Convention Center, where we had nine teams compete before five judges. Uh, the, uh, the item that they were competing for or the award was for uh, mentorship and um, uh, a networking package from the Hive in the center uh, or in Virginia Beach at Town Center from the Hive Center. And so uh, the teams perform out in an outstanding manner. We had three teams from the Kempsville Entrepreneur Academy they did very well. Uh, two of the winners came from the academy. Uh, the first winner, first place winner was World Play. The second place winner was Swag Stick. Uh, and we also had other uh, individuals throughout the city who had wonderful ideas and concepts and also businesses that they presented. Very awe-inspiring, the feedback that I received uh, and it is potential um, that as we move forward in the future, our young people, young adults will want to stay here because they have opportunities like this to pitch their idea, to pursue their business dreams and goals right here in our city. And so that the forum uh, that was provided for them on the 12th uh, was certainly an arena and a forum to do so. Uh, one of our guest judges was Dr. Angela Reddix. Uh, she was very uh, taken back by some of the teams who uh, performed, and she certainly wants to help a lot of them. And as she reached out to me to let me know. And so just an excellent opportunity for our city to shine, uh, to provide a forum for our young adults to present their ideas. And so I'm really looking forward to the future, um, of how great... Uh, we can continue to provide opportunities for uh, entrepreneurs and young adults. And I would say in talking with young adults throughout the city, one of the things they do say to me is, you know, Ms. Wooten, I would stay here if I had a forum um, to pursue my aspirational goals as an entrepreneur or a business owner. And so I'm very hopeful that Virginia Beach is and will be that city to uh, help our young adults do so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Bellucci, and then Mr. Tower. Thank you, Mayor. Well, um, I wasn't really planning on um, 
uh, making a report today, but something did come to my mind that I think is worth sharing, I think is kind of neat. And that is after many years of a hiatus, the World 1000 Catamaran Race, which is an iconic race that goes from Fort Lauderdale to Virginia Beach, an offshore um, sailing race, is coming back. It's going to come back to Virginia Beach in May. And I think it's a really exciting opportunity. The catamarans, for those of us who grew up here, are iconic to Virginia Beach. In some ways, they sort of um, reflect our um, seaside culture and heritage. And for me, the World 1000 is important because my godfather, um, who lost his life tragically in a plane crash in the 80s, was a champion, was a winner of the World 1000. His name was Ron Anthony. And um, I'm really proud of his accomplishments, and I'm proud of the opportunity that our city has to welcome back the World 1000, um, not only for the impact that it'll have on hotels and restaurants and our economy, but um, on our recreational culture and um, seaside culture and coastal culture in Virginia Beach. So welcome back, World 1000. Guy. Speaking of welcoming back, and I hope I'm not stepping on any announcement you were going to make, Mr. Mayor, but I, Go for I'm, it, guy. I'm so pleased to look and see that the Oceana Air Show is returning this fall. Uh, and not only that, they're bringing the Blue Angels with them. And the Blue Angels are now flying the F-18. Super. Super F-18E. Super. Super F -E's super. Or anything, yes. That uh, on the flight line at Oceana, um, it's expected it'll bring a quarter of a million or more people to our city in September of this year. Uh, the Blue Angels haven't been here. We haven't had, had an air show in a couple of years, and the Blue Angels haven't been here since 2018, I believe. So this is very exciting news, and uh, I'm happy. Um, I'm privileged to have the Oceana Naval Air Station in my district, and I'm really happy to... Uh, tell the public that it's coming back. Thank You're you. back. Ms. Henley. Uh, well, I apologize for being late uh, to the meeting, but uh, previously scheduled for today was the uh, time when the, uh, the folks from Virginia Tech were to come and meet with our engineers this morning uh, to coordinate the work that they're doing with our forestry and flooding um, a study with uh, what we are doing with our stormwater modeling and so forth. And I understand they had a very profitable morning, but then for the afternoon they're meeting with the, the group of partners who have come together to uh, have all of this study done, the folks from uh, Nature Conservancy and the Department of Forestry and Lynn Haven River Now and, and so forth. And, uh, and I, I really wanted to hear Dr. McLaughlin give his uh, up-to-date presentation, and so uh, I took off a few minutes from here to go over there and hear that. Of course, they, this is a study that started three years ago, and they did the, first, the phase one and made that report, and uh, phase two was supposed to have been uh, done last year, but with the pandemic and not being able to get the graduate students that he needed to do it, he was not able to finish it, but they are working on it this year and expect to have it uh, delivered complete by the fall. But, of course, this whole idea of forest as a part of flood reduction, I think, is something that we've been talking about, and we've talked about it a good bit now with our return of our open space program that possibly having as one of its primary purposes <coughs> to help in, in flood reduction. Of course, this study is based on quantifying the amount of water that stored and lost in forest versus other land types. And, and there are different types of forests, too. And the intent of this phase two is to let us know which patches of forest provide the greatest amount of benefit. So if we do get into acquiring properties, we will know which ones are the ones that are really going to do the benefit that we want to do uh, with forestry. Just one of the the things that I think is a, a great takeaway in, in the very basic analysis of what we have is that forests cover 29% of the city's land area. That's, that's pretty good for a city of our size. But the forests remove 46% of its water via evapotranspiration. And it's this, this type of, of evapotranspiration in addition to the other 
things that we think about with forests that we're really calculating with this. And the, the unique thing is that this, this work is giving us the science so that we can tell you exactly how much water a particular patch is going to be able to uh, take out of the, the process for us. We can already do that with a web tool that they created with the phase one. And this is all going to be refined quite a lot uh, with what they're doing in phase two. Uh, so that we can really quantify the reduction rate and the data and the with the storage models. And working it with the SWIM models and so forth is what they're coordinating now so that what, what is going to come from this is going to fit right in with our modeling and so forth. So we're going to be able to look at a patch of forest and we say, if we take that forest out, what is going to be the loss? It's not going to be just a we think it will or it probably will, but we'll be able to know. And, and I think this is just as fantastic data that we're going to be getting or that we are getting out of this work. And, and the folks at, at Virginia Tech who are working on it are, are really, uh, it, it's such a valuable thing for us individually, but also knowing that this data can not exactly be transferred to another locality because it's all going to depend on each locality's dynamics, but the data and the process will be able to be transferred to other places as well. And they have already been uh, reported in some of the uh, 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 publications, national publications, and they make sure that Virginia Beach is right there so that everybody will know that Virginia Beach is doing this kind of work. And I, I think it's really fantastic to know that, that, uh, that, that we're going to be having this in a, a few short months and we'll be able to put it to good work, I hope, with, uh, with some of our future acquisitions. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Henley. That is very good news. Aaron and then John. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. How about them Hokies, huh? Yes. Ser Hokies. Serving all the way around in all capacities um, as well. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I know there, there's been a quite uh, an announcement on, on my future concerning um, on this body, um, but I only feel it's right that we get to the, the people business first, and at the end of the night, um, I prepared a statement, if you will. Yeah, we can me. do that during a new business. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, also, um, Vice Mayor Wilson brought up something um, that I thought was Im important, and it's at the ocean front, considering bike lanes and bike paths. As you know, tourist season is right here on the cusp, starting very, very soon. Um, I think we, we got to kind of um, highlight our bike path as an avid, you know, bike rider. There are people constantly walking in the bike path all the time, and there are many conflicts. So, uh, Michael Kirschman, you're, you're very good at, at uh, really finding those solutions. Um, but I think if we could add a new strip of paint down there, to, it'll do wonders um, just to kind of let people know they're, they're on the bike path. And, and last but not least, uh, as Councilman Tower stated, I'm really excited that the, the air show is returning. Um, since a kid, I haven't missed an a air show um, here in, in Virginia Beach. And uh, the, the past couple of years that we've missed it, the, the Thunderbirds, uh, the F-15, F, the Air Force F-16 um, Fighting Falcons, but referred to as the Vipers were here, and they, they put on quite a show as well. But um, looking forward to the Oceana air, air show coming back. and. Seeing the F-22 demo team is one of my favorites, and uh, I, I can't wait. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Mr. John? I wanted to pick up on Mrs. Henley's comments, only because it's something that Lewis and I know for our own neighborhood. I think many of you know the 1632 Old Donation Episcopal Church there on uh, Witch Duck Road had a probably trees that went back to the foundation lane of the actual church and to meet the stormwater management regulations that now exist those considerations of what those trees offered and did were uh, cut down to make way for something that is probably not as effective as the trees, and certainly it's not as aesthetic pleasing, I can assure you. So, so hopefully from that good work, we won't find ourselves repeating those kind of uh, meet the letter of the law, but it was not the smartest answer, but it's where we were and it's the rules we had to enforce. But I look forward to getting better science for better rules. If I can just comment, we have certainly offered our data at, with the General Assembly considering all of these tree things. And, you know, it, I don't know why it's so difficult, but clearly with this second phase that we're doing, we're going to be able to show what the benefit is. And we're hoping that the value of the tree can help to offset some of what is otherwise being 
uh, being required. So I think this has a tremendous amount of applicability uh, throughout all of this. And I think it's going to be something that uh, we'll be able to use in many different ways. I mentioned the open space, but I think in other ways as well, it's going to give us that real data. And I think that's what is so important, uh, particularly if we're going to ever convince uh, <coughs> folks that, that we need to be able to be a little bit more flexible uh, sometimes with what's on that lot. Anybody else? Okay, Linwood. Scott, did you have something? No, I was just going to add the uh, 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 one more comment on the Oceana Air Show. The, uh, the, as part of that, I believe the STEM, student STEM uh, tr uh, production exhibition with a lot of STEM uh, exhibits by and for students is also going to be uh, robotics and the like. I think it's also going to be a part of that. All right, great. Linwood. Thanks. Well, since we're mentioning air shows and World 1000s, we've got to mention the Shamrock Marathon also. Jerry and Amy Frostick do a great job and looking forward to a great event this year, their 50th anniversary this year. Yep, and uh, we welcome them back too. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, I just got a couple quick things. Uh, speaking of the Oceana show, and uh, Guy and Aaron, I want to thank you for your comments. Um, I had the pleasure of att attending the news conference this morning, you know, with Captain Holmes. And the real point I want to make out, I think you articulated very well the importance of Oceana, how complimentary Captain Holmes was, not only to the city, but particularly this body, <clears throat> on how we work with the Navy. And I think that's, once again, another uh, example of how our resilience and tenacity as a city and you'll be hearing that tomorrow a couple times, you know, on how, you know, we made it through. Uh, and But uh, once again, let me just bring up another thing. Um, our surf, uh, uh, East Coast Surf ch uh, Championships. We, two years ago, when we, the world was in a shutdown, we had the only surf competition in the world, okay? They did it virtually. There weren't that many people actually on the beach. The spacing was there. But it was officially endorsed surf competition to the point is we now have the world record for surfing competition. And that was taken notice by the folks at Van Shoes, who is a big sponsor of these events. Well, this year, uh, you know, we're all proud to announce that the World Surf League, which <coughs> is the in international uh, surf communication, the top um, professional surfers in the world are going to be uh, performing at the East Coast Surfing Championship. And once again, bringing back the Shamrock, bringing back the Neptune Festival. Hey, we're, right now, we are in the version of being a, a version of the Comeback Kids right here in Virginia Beach. We're coming back stronger and a lot better and really better. And I'll tell you once again, I can't underscore the hard work so many people, this body, this government, and the community put in to get us through some of the darkest times in the history of America. Okay, thank you. All right. Madam Vice Mayor, if we could do the consent. Okay, under ordinance, this is uh, resolutions uh, 1A and B. We have speakers, so we will be pulling that. Uh, number two, A and B. Um, can that go on consent? Or? Are we okay with uh, number two on consent? Good for consent. Okay. Number three, to refer to the Planning Commission about tattoo parlors and body piercing. Good for consent. Um, number four, the, revolu uh, the resolution to revise the membership of the 531 Memorial Committee. Everybody okay with that? Um, Vice Mayor. Yes. Yeah. Mayor, if, if it's okay, if I could just make a quick comment on number three. Sure. Um, yeah. I, uh, I agree with, with uh, adding it to the consent, but I did hear from someone who's in the industry yesterday who expressed um, some... Uh, I wouldn't say concerned, some, offered some feedback 
about that. So I just I think it's uh, all we're doing here is sending it to planning. Yes. And we'll have lots of time for engagement from the industry and every other stakeholder. And I just want to offer that clarification because this is um, just for more discussion. Right. Um, Great. Thank for you. clarification, Michael, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't hear it. You're referring to item um, K3, correct? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I was. I want to echo yeah. those same sentiments. It's just going to the Planning Commission. Yeah, yeah John? Since we're at a pause, I wasn't going to break your rhythm there, Vice Mayor. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> so you. I think that 1A could go on the consent agenda. I'm just withdrawing, and I sent you all a letter. I don't need why we need a separate <coughs> vote. Well. Because you can still, the issue is we're voting in a vote on B. I guess you have enough speakers to speak um, on both. I guess, okay, I was just trying to look for a way. Do we a have multiple speakers? Um, we do, yes. Okay. okay, well, we can do a combined motion then. Maybe we can do it combined. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, and number four, all right, number five and six, we have speakers, so we'll put that, we'll be pulling that. Uh, number seven to the franchise agreements. Everybody okay with the franchise agreements? A through Q. Okay, number eight, the ordinance to change and reordain the city code for the polling place at, Lund at Lansdowne. Everybody okay? Number nine, to approve the assignment of the franchise operation and maintenance of the Virginia Beach Fishing Pier. Everybody okay with that? Okay, number 10, the resolution to authorize the city manager, city clerk to place an advertisement regarding various permit inspection regarding increases as part of the 22-23 budget process. I'm voting no, and this is why. I have communicated to the staff. We have lots of summary information of what, how much we're increasing the fee that's been in place since 2004. It represents a 66% increase or 3.7% per year. There's no explanation of why all of a sudden it has to go up 66%. So. I don't know what the public is going to get to comment on, but if we're going to advertise something and say it's ready to be advertised, then I think this body should know what reasoning we're giving to the public for increasing it and why after 18 years of no increase, what happened in those 18 years of no increase and why all of a sudden it's 66%. So I don't know what the public's going to get in terms of, because you can't comment on nothing. And so I'm voting no because I don't know what the public's going to get and how do you advertise if the public isn't being provided something to comment on other than the price went up. So I just don't think that's fair to the public. So okay, that's, I'm voting no. How about everybody else? Everybody else okay? All right. All right, number 11, the authorize, uh, ordinance to authorize temporary encroachments into a portion of the city-owned property. There's A, uh, known as Bass Inlet. Everybody okay with that? That's Princess Anne, Barbara. And the other one is Treasure Canal, which is um, Lynn Haven. Mr. Branch, are you okay with that? Yes. Number 12, the ordinance to extend the sunset date to April 5th uh, for residential parking in the historic Cavalier Shores neighborhood, and that's for four hours. I, believe, I looked at it. Mr. Tower. I'm sorry. I was looking at uh, Cavalier Shores. Oh, that's mine, yeah. yeah I'm, yeah. I'm fine with consent on this. <laughs> I remember last you year. You said that with such enthusiasm, guys. <laughs> last year we changed it from three hours to four hours so the people could have, be there longer at the beach. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's status quo. Okay. Number 13, the ordinance to accept 15604 from the Virginia Aquarium Foundation to the capital project. Everybody okay with that? Okay, open the public hearing on planning. The only one that is on, is pulled, is number nine, by the way. Um, really? And that's going to be in favor. So, uh, number one, 1252 Jensen Street, and that is Beach District, Mr. Tower. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question of Mr. DeHaan before? Yeah. Of course. Say, Bobby, um, I, I was uh, had a SeaTac Civic League meeting last night, and the two concerns that were expressed about this i just want to make sure they're in here uh one was the uh there's apparently originally a request for an entry on bird neck it's road that's now been changed so the entry's only on jensen is that correct the truck traffic the 
the delivery traffic can only come in from Jensen. Okay. There is access proposed on Birdneck, but it's only for the parking for customers. Okay. I think that's that was my issue. Yes, sir. Thanks. Okay. Is that? Yep. Okay. Number two, Whitney Triplin Pass, James Pass, and Whitney Triplin Pass, uh, Kempsville. Good. Okay. Number three, N three Property Advisors, Virginia Beach Investment Company, Auto Repair, and that is <coughs> Centerville. You can place it on consent. Thank you. Thank you. Number four, NMP-C4 Fairfield SC LLC, conditional use permit for a, a mini warehouse, and that is Kempsville. I like. Danielle Good and Cynthia Schott in Byler Lakes for a conditional use permit for a tattoo parlor, and that is in <coughs> Rose Hall. Okay, for, for consent, thank you. Michael, you got all the tattoo parlors going on. That's why we're seeing it to the Planning Commission. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't have any yet. Yeah, so. come to Rose Hall, get a test. <laughs> uh, number six, Alenia Wesley, uh, Alvin, and Cynthia Alley Wesley for conditional use permit, residential kennel, Whitechapel Court, and that is in Bayside. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers signed up? No, no sir, not yet. Okay, I'm fine then. It's also in the ninth district, and I do have some thoughts. Okay. First of all, I've been by this place several times in the evenings, and I've called Bobby Tahan and shared some of them with him. So to document where these dogs one have been outside, I don't know how many, you can't see through the fence, but they're barking at night for long periods of time, like 25 minutes, at least one instance. So I also, they're having this particular place so they, for a short time, because she plans to get rid of these dogs, and so I think it should be for a period of one year to make sure that the dogs transition off the property. I've also walked around and spoke to the neighbors, especially the adjacent neighbor. That's the gentleman I told you about that was in the wheelchair. So I think one year is plenty of time to get, to get the dogs down below the kennel number, which is why she's applying. So I would like to see that what the applicants here, they would agree to that one year conditional use permit in light of what we're trying to solve as a short-term problem not a long-term so kennel situation. Do you want to work that out ahead of time or do you want to pull it? Well, well, I don't think I'll work it out ahead of time, but if not, I would want to pull it so we could get it worked out. So I'll, I'll leave that to see if with the applicant. Okay. But I, I have monitored that property and there is and, a and dog Mr. barking problem. Mr. Moss brought up a, a point that we, we don't have the new districts in here like we had been having. What well, did say, yeah, it did uh, say in here. It says District 4 Bayside. But then, but I think it says I think it says District Nine, formerly District Four, Bayside. I think is what mine says. Whitechapel Court District. Uh, yeah, this one. Okay, mine says formerly District Four, Bayside. Okay, well, mine does too, but right it says District that, Nine. Says district anyway, nine. right okay. before that, before the parentheses, it says District Nine. But by the way, you know, you know council member requested. Uh, we, an we, uh, it's in there. During, when it came up at the Planning Commission, was there any discussion uh, as to how long it was going to take them to get it down to the four dogs? There was not, but the applicant has five personal dogs, which is over the number as well. So um, I don't know if they'll be agreeable. I will have to ask the applicant if they'll be I'll agreeable. Like pull it and ask them. Okay. <clears throat> I've got it pulled. All right, number seven, Tandang Regency Hilltop Associate, conditional use for a tattoo parlor, uh, Alaskan Road, Mr. Tower. No problem with that. Okay, and number eight, CNC Development Company for conditional use permit, short-term rentals, 22nd Street, A and B, Mr. Tower. I'm happy to have that on the consent agenda as well. Okay, and number nine, we've pulled, and it's their speaker is in favor. Uh, number nine is just the applicant signed up, I believe, right there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. it. All right, we thank you. To pull sure. that. All righty, moving on, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from the open meeting allowed by uh, Section 2.23711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following proposals, purposes, legal matters, consultation um, with legal counsel and briefing staff members uh, or consultants pertaining to actual probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body pursuant to section 2.23711A7 
and that's pertaining to the city of Virginia Beach versus uh, WC Capital. <coughs> um, legal matters, consultation with legal counseling employed or retained by a public body regarding a specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pursuant to section 2.2-3711-A8 uh, recycling contract. Public uh, contract discussion of award of public contract involving the expenditures of public funds and discussions of the terms or scope of such contract where discussion in an open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-3711-A-29 Atlantic Park and uh, prospective business or industry discussions concerning a uh, prospective business or industry or expansion of existing business or industry where no previous announcement has been made of the business or industry's in interest in locating or expanding its facilities in the community pursuant to section 2.2-3711-A5 and that's project coastal and project sign and then finally personnel matters discussion considerations or interviews of prospective candidates for employment assignment appointment promotion performance demotion salaries disciplining or resignation of specific public officers appointees or employees of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-3711-A1 and that would be council appointees, council, boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. Motion and a second. The vote's open. Five out of 11 is zero. You're recessed to closed session. Okay. We are now recessed into executive.